Okay. So we'll continue talking about St. John the Short. Um, so he was moved not so much um, uh, because of some, some righteousness, but it was, it's clearly a calling. And the monastic life is a calling. It's not something we resort to. It's not something we do when we can't get married. It's not something we do when we can't find a job. It's something God calls us to do. It's this very specific thing. And obviously he felt this calling, and so he went into the wilderness. There he came upon a tried and holy old man whose name was Emba Pimwa. And Emba Pimwa is a very famous monk. John knelt before Emba Pimwa and asked him to allow him to stay with him. And so again comes another very key part of, of the tradition of the church, of spiritual life which is finding the Father. It's very important that we do that. So the, 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 way, the way spiritual life evolves, has evolved in the last century, is it's moved from um, discipleship to meetings, like this one. Right? And meetings don't achieve the objective that we hope they achieve. Meetings are good for kind of like, you know, mass amounts of knowledge. So if I want to instill knowledge in people, I can in a large group. And if I want to give a talk, I can. And I can gather a lot of people and I can kill a lot of birds with one stone. But ultimately, Christianity isn't about that. It's really about discipleship. And you disciple on a particular person or two, right? And that becomes your father, right? And you just sort of learn to grow with that person. Right? And eventually, that person isn't the person that, he, that, that he's leading you to himself or herself. They're leading you to Christ, and they're just kind of that mediator. Right? But you see that this has always been the model. Right? Christ does this. He picks disciples, and he disciples them for three and a half years. And he walks with them, and he talks with them, and he eats with them, and he jokes with them. And they hang out together, and they tell stories, right? and he lives with them. Right? And so this should ultimately be the model of discipleship. Right? And unfortunately, you know, we all get into service, we get into Sunday school, we get into whatever, and Sunday school is like a very bland, a very sterile environment. Right? I have 30 kids, they're all hungry, they're bouncing off each other, they haven't seen each other in a week, they're all screaming. I'm like, listen, everyone! Noah's Ark! And we're just yelling, and they're yelling, and they're throwing things at each other, and they're looking down, pretending not they didn't throw the thing. And this is just what's happening, right? And it isn't the natural order of things in Christian life, right? We're called, if you're, if you're called to be a servant, you're called to disciple people, right? Which means you be in their life over and over and over again. You talk to them, and you walk with them, and you eat with them, and you drink with them, and you hang out with them. Right? And that's what we do as Christians, because that's what Christ taught us to do. And then we see this tradition very, very clear in the monastic fathers. We see it even in the patristic fathers, right? that they have a father, right? and they, they live with that person, and they learn from that person. Right? And so John did the right thing, moved by the Holy Spirit, St. John the Short, and he went to this father and he said, I want to be your disciple. The old man answered, trying him, my son, you cannot stay with us, for this is a very hard desert, and those who dwell in it eat from the work of their hands, besides observing many fasts, prayers, and sleeping on the floor, and many other forms of asceticism. He enumerated for him the difficulties of monasticism, but Ioannis was firm in his, in his intention. So, Amba Pimwa did the exact right thing. He's like, just go away. You're 18, you're a good-looking guy, go get married. It's life is hard here. This isn't for you. Right? And that's actually the right answer for monasticism. Whenever anyone says, I want to be a monk, the right answer is, you probably shouldn't be a monk. Right? Because if you look at the numbers, the numbers are pretty clear. Right? There's you know, 20 million cops in Egypt and maybe like 2,000 monks, right? men-wise. Okay, so that's just not a very common calling. Right? We are called mostly to be married. And so he is you know, trying to dissuade him from joining this lifestyle, which is good. But further, more so than just a monk for the rest of us, right? You know, Christ talks about, you know, he, he gives us these analogies of like, you know, before you start to build, 
You know, you need to start and calculate the cost of building, lest halfway through you end the building. Or if you're going to go to war with someone who has, I forget the numbers, 20,000 and you only have 10,000, you need to figure that out before. Otherwise, you go and make peace with your enemy. Okay? And so even in the Christian life, the calling that we get is, is, a call, is a challenge calling. It's a difficult calling. The life of Christianity is not easy. Right? And you shouldn't just take it on because your parents are Coptic and Orthodox. That's not why we become Christians. Right? It's, this is not something you're born into. It really isn't. Right? So this idea of being a cradle Orthodox, well, I was raised in the church, that doesn't mean anything. Right? What means something is at some point in your life you say to yourself, I am going to take this on. And when you do, someone's going to say to you, it's very difficult. This is challenging. Right? And unfortunately, you know, and we've talked about this before, somehow Christianity and Orthodoxy has become more of a kid's religion. Right? We do all this stuff for the kids, and we have plays, and we have competitions, and we have retreats, and we have athletics, and we have all this stuff for kids. Right? And it's almost like all the activities are geared for the kids, but then you become an adult, and you guys are starting to notice this already. This is less for you, right? Now it's like a college retreat, maybe a GYP retreat, and then you're like, okay, just go away now. Right? And then you think to yourself, gee, is this a kid's place? Is this like, you know, we have plays and stuff and all the things for the kids, and they sing and they wear little, you know, clothes, and we clap for them. Right? Christianity is involved, right? It's tough. Okay? And so what Emba Pimo is telling St. John, he, he should be saying to all of us, which is before you start this, you need to sit down and say, am I going to do this? And you have to say it like that. Am I going to do this? And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And all of us at some point in our lives have to pick that moment, right? Where we say, look, am I going to do this Christianity? I'm not saying go to Sunday school or learn hymns or do stuff your parents don't. No, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about accepting God in my life. Am I going to do this? And am I going to accept the cost that comes with that decision? And am, I, am I really, for me, not for my parents, but for me, going to embark on this endeavor? Right? And if I make that choice, I should be ready for the fasts and the prayers and the difficulty, and not just the physical things, right? The warfare that will come with that decision, right? As soon as you decide, I want Christ in my life, there's warfare, and it comes right away. And it comes hot and heavy, and it comes fast, right? And it's designed to break you, right? And you have to be ready and make that decision purposefully and, and meticulously and say, yeah, that's a decision I'm going to make. Right? So when he says there's lots of fasting and prayers and sleeping on the floor and many forms of asceticism, this is something we all experience, and not just in the difficult monastic life, but in the difficulty of Christian life. And so, so St. John said, do not send me away for God's sake because I came to be in your obedience and prayers. If you accept me, I believe that God will make your heart well pleased with me and God will help me with your prayers. He's very humble. And that's what I love about St. John the Short. His humility is, is, is borderline ridiculous. And we're going to see his humility here in a bit. But he, had, he ultimately had that characteristic of the child. Right? And Christ said, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to see that in his life, throughout his life. Child. And there's just, I was reading up on him over the last few days, and just the number of stories they have about him in the, in the Bustan, in the Paradise of the Fathers, is just, it's, it's so amazing because what you find in him is this sensitivity, right? This very sensitive heart. Like, you know, even stories like he didn't want to make someone feel bad, so he just kind of you know, feigned illness a little bit and just said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm tired, I'm going to rest here all night, just so that he wouldn't hurt the feelings of, of another person. Right? And, and, a, and a child has that kind of just sensitivity. Right? When, when a child feels hurt or feels like he hurts someone else, has anyone ever seen a child just burst into tears? Right? That's, that's the kind of love and sensitivity children have for one another. I remember, um, I shouldn't tell this story. So, um, <laughs> um, I won't tell the story, right? So, anyway, children have this sensitivity. Um, 
Emba Pimwa asked the Lord Christ to reveal to him the reality of this young man. This is beautiful. So, whenever we have issues, we have decisions to make, um, we start thinking. And we start thinking about how to make this decision and what's the best approach, what's the smartest thing to do. And usually about step number seven or eight, if you get there, you think to yourself, Lord, what do you want me to do? And sometimes we don't get to step that step until we've exhausted steps, the first seven steps, right? We've asked this person, we've asked this person, let's talk to them, talk to them. Who should I talk to? Who should I call? Who should I blah, 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 blah. And then you finally go, why don't I just ask God? And sometimes God just reveals to you the depth of this mystery. He says, you should just ask me and I'll just give you the answer. And so what I love about Emba Pimwa is he did his due diligence, right? He said, ah, this life is hard, kid. You know, go away. Go get your, you know, iPhone and go just get on Instagram and hang out, right? And, and then he said, you know what? I'm just going to ask God. I'm just going to go directly to the source. And believe me, when we ask with this kind of sincere heart, God gives answers. He really does, right? So he asked him, the reality of this young man. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Accept this brother, for he shall become a chosen vessel. And so, of course, in the case of Emba Pimwa, right, he gets a revelation, right? You know, these guys get the good stuff, okay? We get more subtle messages than that. But one of the important things to note about this, this decision is this boy is young and he's short. Right? And, you know, there's bias in the world, right? Short people don't have it easy. Okay? And, you know, you look at an 18 year old and he's a short kid, you're like, ah, you're not, you're not really cut out for this. Right? Do you think that influenced them by Pimwa at all? To see a little, little 18 year old boy? Sure. Right? And if you notice, Emba, and, and later we'll, we'll see this in the story. Emba, Emba, St. John the Short's father, one of his fathers is Emba Pshoy. St. Pshoy. And the beautiful thing about St. Pshoy is the story of St. Pshoy, if you guys remember, is his mom had a dream. And this angel appeared to her and said, and I think she had seven or eight kids, I can't remember. And uh, the angel appeared to her and said, one of your kids is going to be a rock star. She, he didn't use that word, but you know, you know what I'm saying. And she said, oh, and in her dream... She laid out the seven kids and she skipped over Emba Pshoy because he was a runt. He was a small kid. And then he's like, nope, none of these. And he said, well, no, I mean, she's like, it can't be Pshoy. He's like, you know, small and he's tiny and he's weak. I mean, he may die. I don't think he's going to live. Right. And, she, and the angel said, no, that's the one. Right? And if you remember the story of David, same story. Right. The, 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 the prophet came to him and, and he said, you know, show me your sons. And he showed him all his big, strong sons. And he said, no, 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 no. He's, he goes, well, I got, there's a little shepherd boy out there, but he's worthless. And God said, yeah, that's the one. Right. And so this just reminds me of the verse, my strength is perfected in weakness. Right. And so this little 18-year-old boy, he's young, he's small, he's not strong, he's not big, he's not athletic, doesn't have a deep voice. And God says, that's the one. That's the rock star. Right? Why? Because he's weak. He's weak. And that's where I shine. The problem with the strong, mighty guys is that when they succeed, they attribute it to their strong mightiness, their personality, their character, their intellect, their athleticism, their ability to speak, their ability to memorize tunes, their ability to whatever, right? But the weak ones, they know better, right? And so God works in the weak ones. He loves the weak ones, right? The broken ones. So he says, accept this brother, for he shall become a chosen vessel. Emba Pemwa accepted him, shaved the hair of his head, 
and dressed him with the monastic garb. So he's quite young and he put a monastic garb on him right away. St. John started his monastic life with great assism and splendid works. One day, Emba Pimmo wanted to test St. John. So, why would a father do this? This is nice. So what did he do? He expelled him out from his cell saying, I cannot live with you. Get out. All right, now, I don't know. I mean, maybe he just couldn't handle him. You know, I don't know, right? But maybe he was just testing him. Either way, he said some, something pretty harsh. Now, I want you to imagine you're an 18-year-old. You've left your life, gone to the middle of the desert. This guy is all you got. You have one guy, right? It's not like monasteries now where there's like 100, 200 guys, right? There's kind of these little um, groups of monks and they, their cells may be separated by a few kilometers apart. And so you're with this one person, right? You live with him. He's taught you everything. He's sustained you. You're living, you're alive because of him. And he says, get out. What, do you, what runs through your head? And the question comes back to, what do you think of yourself? Do you think, who are you to talk to me like that? How dare you? Is that, is that the question? And so his, his uh, Emba John, his response is amazing. He doesn't just say, all right, well, forget you. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'll find another father. If you don't love me, whatever. I don't need you. Emba John stayed out by the door of St. Pimwa's cell for seven days. What does that remind you of? Little child. Even worse, like a puppy dog. Right? If you lock a puppy dog out of the house, he just stands by the door and he waits to be let in. And he doesn't... And then when you open the door after seven days for the puppy dog, what does the puppy dog do? He wags his tail and says, thank you for letting me in. There's a story about St. Moses, uh, St. Moses the Strong, St. Moses the Black, St. Moses the Ethiopian, whatever you want to call him. Um, the bishop wanted to test him. And so he brought him to the front and they said, we're going to make you a priest today. So when, the, when this monk walked up, and of course, you know, racism is alive and well back then, still is. The bishop goes, who's this black guy that you brought to me to become a priest? Get him out of here. And so he turned around and Emba, St. Moses the Black left the church. And then the bishop said, call him back. So he called him back and he ordained him a priest. Okay. Now the, 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 the good part of this story is they asked St. Moses, what did you think when the bishop kicked you out? And what did you think when the bishop told you to come back? And he said, when the bishop kicked me out, I thought to myself, yeah, the bishop's right. What's he doing ordaining this black guy who's a piece of garbage, whose history is murder and rape and everything else that I've done? Why, why, why would he ordain me a priest? Bishops inspired. And then he said, well, what did you think when he called you back? He said, I'm just like a dog. You know, when you tell the dog, shoe, dog shoes. And you tell the dog, come back, I come back. So he had made himself so simple that he felt like a dog. He's like, you tell me to go there, I'll go there. You tell me to come back, I'll come back. That's the simplicity with which St. Moses the Black approached this. St. John the Short had an sim equal simplicity. His father kicks him out and he says, okay, I'll just, I'll wait by the door. I'll just stand there for seven days. Every day, <laughs> this one's funny. Every day, Emba Pimmo went out and smote him with a palm branch. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, you know, I, I could see what Andrew doing that, to be honest. They just, you know, hitting you with a palm branch, right? And Emba John bowed down in extreme humility before him saying, I have sinned my father. So he would keep doing this, like, get out of here. I can't live with you. And yet he took on this extreme humility. Now, obviously this is, this is a very high level of humility. This is extreme but what I want you to learn from the lesson is sometimes we don't take anything. I mean, 
your parents look at you the wrong way and you're like, who are you to talk to me like this? Your friends diss you, your, the church disses you, the priest, the deacon, the servant, the whatever disses you. And you immediately, like, who the heck are you to talk to me like that? Right? And, and we, we see this often in relationships, right? When there's a relationship between a couple and someone says something that they probably shouldn't say, like, really, you can talk to me like that? Well, you know what you are? And boom, we're off to the races. Okay? So you can see his reaction is extreme, but it's making a, a point that's very applicable to all of us. How do you react when you're insulted? You know? And sometimes we hear these things in Arabic, you know, like, Dikaramti, you know what this expression means? This is my dignity. And you put your one finger up like this, and that's automatic trump card. That means you win. Right? This is my dignity. And everyone goes, oh, your dignity. In that case, you should kill him. And he goes, yes, I should. See my finger? Right? So this dignity thing, this ego thing that's very common in Arab males, right? what is that? That isn't Christian. That isn't St. John the Short. That's nothing we see in Jesus or really anyone. So where's that from? I don't know. It's not Christian. Right? But yet when you say, you know, they insulted my dignity, they came to my house and said those things. And everyone goes, oh, yep. shoot him in the face. Right? That's absolutely, that's grounds for whatever you want to do. And you, you see what he does. Right? Stand outside. And then every day hits him with a palm branch. <laughs> Again, these are extreme examples, right? But they point to things that happen in our life all the time. Because I've been metaphorically hit with a palm branch before. I've had people insult me like that before. I've had people hurt me like that before. And, and it's painful. On the seventh day, the old man went out to go to the church and he saw an angel with a crown placing it on the head of Emba John, of St. John the Short. And so Emba Pemwa goes out and he sees a, a vision of an angel placing a crown on his head. Like, you took this crown of obedience and you put your ego to nothing. Right? Now, Christ, what does Christ talk about in the ego? Remember, he says, he says we're supposed to do what with the self? Deny the self. Right? There is no self. There is no me. There is no my self-esteem and my pride and my respect and how you should talk to me and how you should treat me. You're willing to be the puppy dog. You're willing to be the person who gets insulted, who gets dissed, right? that gets, who doesn't get listened to. That's okay. Right? And that's kind of good for us. Since that day, Emba Pimwa loved him and accepted to live with him. One day, Emba Pimwa wanted to test his obedience. Again, he's pushing him. Why is he pushing him? Because just like anything else in life, the spiritual life has to be pushed. Right? You guys know that, you know, um, academically, right? If if my third grader comes home from school, you know, in February, and I'm like, hey, what'd you learn in school? They're like, oh, nothing. It's the same stuff I learned in the second grade. I'm like, oh, this is February. You should be learning new material by now. And then you get to the eighth grade and you're like, hey, what did you learn in eighth grade? Oh, same stuff we learned in second grade. Well, we have a problem, right? And the problem is there's no growth. The problem is you aren't being what? Pushed, right? I mean, every once in a while, like, I mean, just this morning, I was, I'm sitting in office hours and the student comes to me and goes, and she didn't do the homework right. She's like, how could I have possibly known this? I didn't know this, you know, coming into class. I'm like, that's why it's called school. I mean, that's exactly what I said. I said, it's called school. So you, I, you, you know, say, how would I know this? I'm like, well, you take this class, you do it wrong. I tell you to do it right, and then you do it right. Right? And if you already knew it, then you'd be wasting your tuition money. Right? So it's a good thing you don't know it. That means I'm teaching you something. Right? What's the point? The point is, everything, everyone has to be pushed, right? Academically, you get pushed, right? You go to college, right? Your, brain, your head hurts, your brain hurts. You're tired after an exam. That's what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to hurt, right? When you work out, it's supposed to hurt, right? If it's easy, you didn't do anything. 
The spiritual life is the same way. You have to get pushed, right? And when, when, you're, when your father sees that you're not being pushed, he pushes you. Kind of like what? People do this all the time, don't they? What do they do? They go out and hire what? Personal coach, right? Personal coach, you see these guys at the gym, and he's coaching you. And what's he doing? Lift more, push harder, pick up the bigger weight. You did this one last month. Do this bigger one over here. You ran two miles, now let's run two and a half. That's what a coach does, right? That's what, you've all had coaches. What do coaches do? They push you. They motivate you. They get you to do more than you thought you could do, right? And so, Emba Pimwal was pushing him. And this, this test is one of my favorite stories in all the stories. He wanted to test his obedience, so he gave him a piece of dry wood, a walking stick, right? You all took botany. It's a dead stick. And said to him, take this wood, plant and water it. St. John obeyed and went on watering it daily, although the source was far away. In, in one of the other um, uh, Gospels I read, it, it was miles away. After three years, that piece of wood sprouted out and grew into a fruitful tree. So the story, take the stick, plant it really far away, walk several miles every day, and water the stick. And this is a very famous story. I'm sure you've all heard this story. And the tree grows, and it's called the tree of obedience. And it actually grew, and it grew until very recently. I was at the monastery last year, and I wanted to see the tree, and apparently some Arab nomads tore it down recently. Yeah, so the tree is now gone, which is just a crime. Um, but, you know, like the monk that was telling me, he's like, yeah, I was here until like a few years ago. It's like very frustrating. Anyway, um, he says, water this tree, and the tree grows, and the tree grows to like to basically till today. And, and the point here is so important for us, right? And the point is this. Sometimes, especially in the service, and especially in our lives, we think a bit too much. And sometimes, especially in the service, we think, what's the right thing to do? And the lesson here is, the right thing to do may not be what you think. Because God can take something, forgive me, stupid, and turn it into something beautiful. Right? So it isn't about the thing. And so you'll see this at churches all the time. People are arguing, what's the best way to do this? We should do this, or we should do this, or we should move this here, and we should move... And the answer is, God can take whatever thing you do and make it into something beautiful. If what? You do it with love. And you do it with obedience. The point isn't being smart. The point is doing everything with love. Right? And so, sometimes we're so focused on making it right and doing it right that we forget God exists. And we forget that God can bless whatever it is and we have lots of stories, the five loaves and the two fish, and stories like this all the time, and take something very small and make it into something very big. Right? And sometimes the, it's absolutely ridiculous what we're doing, and it could be wrong, the wrong thing. But that obedience is really important. right? Not because it's blind obedience, but it does what again? It crucifies the self. Right? Because when he's watering that stick, what's he thinking? That guy's a crazy old man. He's making me walk out here in the desert every single day. And how many demons did St. John fight for three years when he watered that stick, walking in the heat of that desert to, to water a freaking stick? How many demons attacked him? Right? I mean... You know, whenever we do anything that we don't like to do, the demons come racing in. Like, really? Are you going to listen to that guy? Is that how it's going to go? You know better than that. Blah, 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 right? Imagine what he suffered for three years, right? I always think of the woman who put in the two mites, the two, uh, the widow who put in the two mites at the temple. And I imagine her walk to the temple and the amount of demons that came to her and said, are you really just going to put two mites in the box? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Aren't you embarrassed? What if someone sees you? They're going to laugh at you. You're putting in pennies. Imagine 
putting in pennies and you're a grown woman. And imagine that walk to the temple and how many demons attacked her and how many demons attacked him as he was trying to just listen to his dad, listen to his father. Right? And so withstanding those attacks by the demons, again, is a part of our calling as Christians, right? Because in so doing, he kept doing what? Denying himself, like, I'm going to listen. I'm not going to care about what I think. God will bless. God will do. Right? And in the end, God does. Right? And he creates miracles out of really bad ideas. Right? Sometimes ones that we don't think... Um, are, are worth it. Okay. And then he took, Emba Pimwa took some of the fruit and went around to the elder monks saying, take and eat from the fruit of obedience. And this tree still exists in its place in his monastery. That's actually no longer true. I mean, at least if this monk that was talking to me told me the right thing, maybe he was off. And... All right. And I like that he took the fruits and he should look tired, Jason. He took the fruits and he wanted to share it with everyone. Like, look at what the fruits were. Emba Pimwa fell sick for 12 years, during which Ava John served him diligently. Once again, crazy. So this youth shows up at 18, lives with this guy, and now the guy goes sick for 12 years. Imagine the amount of perfection that Ava John is now getting as he has to take care of this old man for 12 years, right? I mean, when my parents get sick, I'm just like, ah, all right, what's, what do you need? You need me to come over? What's happening? What do you want me to do? You want me to go to the doctor with you? Okay. Imagine day and night for 12 years taking care of someone. And again, imagine the warfare. Imagine what's going inside his head. Imagine how many times he was tempted, like, just leave the old guy to die. Who cares? After the way he treated you, he beat you, he smote you with a palm branch for seven days. <laughs> you don't think Satan reminded him of that? This is the guy that hit you with a palm branch and made you stand outside? And now you're going to serve him? And now he expects to be served? Who does he think he is? You don't think St. John had those thoughts? You don't think he's a human being like the rest of us? Right? These are the thoughts we all have. And so sometimes even when we read this story in the Cynic Star, we just gloss over it, right? You know, 12 years, there's a lot of warfare that happens in 12 years, right? Especially when Emba Pimwa throws up on him in the middle of the night and he's got to get up and clean it. And he's like, what am I doing here? What am I doing with this guy? This guy treating me like garbage. Why am I even here? When Amba Pimon was about to depart, he held the hand of, M of St. John the Short and handed him to the elder father, saying, Take and keep him, for he is an angel, not a man. Wow. That's high praise. He's an angel. Because you can imagine what Amba Pemwa saw as he was sick for 12 years and this guy took care of him. He commanded Ava John to stay in the place where he had planted the tree of obedience, and then Emba Pimwa departed in peace. Emba John dwelt beside, the, dwelt beside the tree where he established a large monastery. It happened when Pope Theophilus was ordaining Ava John, and I think that that tree is now in the Deir, the Syrian monastery, Deir Syrian. It happened when Pope Theophilus was ordaining Ava John Hegemon and Abbot, a voice from heaven was heard saying, Axios, Axios, Axios. When this, saint was when this saint consecrated the offering, he was able to know those who were worthy to partake of it and those who were unworthy. Ava John was an extremely humble person. Later on, the Berbers attacked the desert of Skeed in the year 407, so Ava John left the wilderness. He went to Mount Kuzlam in the eastern wilderness nearby the city and dwelt in a cave there. God arranged for him, for him a man of faith to serve him. He brought him all his needs once a week. When he completed his good endeavor, he departed in peace in the cave of Mount Kuzlam. Later on, his disciples relocated his body to the wilderness of Shahid. There, there the Lord wrought many miracles. So in another um, version that I was reading online, they asked him why he escaped when the Berbers attacked. And his answer is stunning. He says, I didn't want them to be murderers on my account. 
because if they had killed me, they'd become murderers. So I didn't escape because I was scared. I escaped because I didn't want blood on their hands. Even the Berbers attacking the monastery, he was thinking of as people, and he didn't want to be a stumbling block to them. And then something really important happened. They relocated his body to the wilderness of Shahid. The Lord wrought many miracles through his body, which is located in the, in the relinquery of the shrine of the three saints of Amakari, the monastery of St. Makari the Great to this day. And his body is still there. I always go, every time I go to St. Makari, I always spend a lot of time there. And it says, the Lord wrought many miracles through his holy body. So, one of the things that we understand in orthodoxy is there is an inverse relationship between revelation and tradition. Okay. So in the early church, there was a lot of revelation. Right? God didn't want something to happen, so people would die. God didn't want something to happen, a big miracle would happen. Right? And we see a lot of this in the early church, <clears throat> big things. I mean, even Book of Acts, right? You know, those, those two, that husband and wife, Sephira and... I forgot the other guy's name. Yeah, they hid money from the apostles, right? And then what happened? They dropped dead. Right? Each one and then the wife came and then she dropped dead. Right? And you see God doing a lot of revelation. Now, again... They were holding back money, and that's not nice. Did they go to hell? I don't know, right? I don't think so. We don't know, right? So just because God killed them and they dropped dead, it doesn't mean he sent them to hell, right? But what he did want to show was the importance of giving with a good heart, right? And so you see this very strong revelation in the beginning of the church, right? Peter and Paul and, and all the miracles, you know, Peter would walk by and the shadow would... Peter's shadow would, would, would heal people, right? Crazy things, right? And then you're like, why aren't all these miracles happening now, right? Because the idea is when, when the miracles happened, we're supposed to take these miracles, write them down and say, okay. And God says, now write down what happened and the next time read about it. I don't need to keep doing these miracles because now you have a living history, a tradition of the church. Right? Like, you know, when the Egbeya was established, they were, trying, they were putting together the number of psalms, and they didn't know how many psalms to put in each hour. And so the tradition of the church says, an angel appeared and started praying psalms. And they counted how many psalms. And he said, and he prayed 12 psalms. And they're like, okay, God wants us to put 12 psalms in each Egbeya. Right? Now, the angel doesn't have to keep appearing. Right? He revealed... And now that's in the tradition. And that's how it continues. Right? This is one of those things. Right? So God wanted to teach us that the relics of saints, that our bodies are holy. They're not just dust that goes away into nothing, but that the body of a saint can actually be a source of holiness. And so you read about stories like this all the time. His relics performed many miracles. I mean, you know how they found St. Mina right? St. Mina's story is amazing, right? They used to, there's a little puddle of water and they used to take the sheep who had skin disease and they put them in this water because this water healed. And then they finally figured out it's St. Mina healing everybody, right? And God wants to say, look, the, these bones, these relics, they can do miracles, right? And after he reveals, we're supposed to write this down and then he doesn't have to keep revealing. So now I can go to the relics of St. John the Short and I can take a blessing from the relics. I don't have to have a miracle. God doesn't have to reveal to me that these relics are holy because he's done it a thousand times already. Make sense? Right? So once God reveals, we write down, and now we know. Right? And this is one of those things, like nobody would have guessed it, that relics would be holy, would, would do miracles, would have a, a fragrant scent coming out of them, or bodies would not decompose. No one would have guessed it, right? But God wanted us to know, no, no, there's more going on here than meets the eye, right? Holiness isn't just on earth, it's also afterwards, right? So this again becomes part of the tradition. And then, oh, it's not in this, it's not in this version. Anyway, does anybody have any questions or comments about St. John the Short?
retrieve obedience. Anything. Okay. Glory be to God forever. Amen.